instruction from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter into the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, and to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now, God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days, and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence, and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food, and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter, and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, their appearance seemed better, and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine that they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. And as for the four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. The days of which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of them all not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. <coughs> Excuse me. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. The dictionary defines compromise as a settlement of differences by mutual concessions, an agreement reached by adjustment of conflicting or opposing claims principles, etc., by reciprocal modification of demands. Compromise, however, can also mean to expose or make vulnerable to danger, suspicion, scandal, etc. Compromise can be a concession to something that is detrimental. And Daniel resisted the call to compromise. Now, the time was about 606 B.C., Daniel and his friends were a portion of what used to be a great and prominent nation. Now being conquered, they were taken into captivity, which was not unusual. It was standard procedure for the conquering nation to take the youngest, the brightest, and the best so that they could ensure they would have a steady flow of slaves for many years to come. Also, by taking the youngest and the strongest, it ensured that they would not rise up in revolution and take over the conquering nation. And so... King of Babylon takes these men into captivity, and we could say that they were sort of freshmen at Babylon State University. Here they're learning a new way of life, being brainwashed, so to speak. That was the intent, anyway, to be molded and shaped, it, molded and shaped to that culture, to teach them a, a new way of living, new education, new literature, new names, all those things. And, and Daniel and his friends didn't seem to have much problem with that. They didn't seem to fuss too much over their new name, their new education, this new way of life, except, except when it came to the food. When it came to what was on the king's menu, Daniel put his foot down. While he may not have had a problem or at least voiced too much of opposition to what was going on before that, Daniel drew a line here. Daniel faced the call to compromise, just as many of us do in this day and age. But Daniel would not waver. He had drawn a line in the sand and said that no matter what, I am not going past this point. Because to eat of the king's food would be defilement. It would be disobedience to God. We need more people like Daniel in this day and age. We need more people who are willing to stand firm in their convictions, who will allow their Christian values to rule them and not allow the world around them to shape them and to mold them. You can bet that as a Christian, your loyalty is going to be put to the test 
that you're going to be asked to compromise with the world at some point. Just as Daniel faced the call to compromise, we will face the call to compromise in this day and age as well. Will we stand convicted or will we compromise? See, I've always said that when it comes to conflict, there are certain hills that you have to be willing to die on. You have to pick those hills. Whether it was as a coach, even as a preacher, there are certain hills that I have to pick whether they're worth dying on. Sometimes we say there are certain swords that are worth falling on and some that are not. The other day I was having a conversation with a gentleman who was telling me all about his superior truck. He had a Ford F-150 and he told me that they don't make them any better than that, that anyone that drives anything less than a Ford is not really even driving uh, anything that's worth anything. And he went on and on about this Ford pickup and how superior it was to every other make and model. And you know what? I could have argued with him. I have a GMC that I think is just as good. I could have argued, but was that a hill worth dying on? Now, if he had attacked my religion, if he had attacked Christianity, if he had said atheism is superior to Christianity, now that's a hill worth dying on. That is something that I would have gone to bat for because that is something that is very near and dear to me and I think is something worth fighting for. And we have to decide what is worth fighting for, what is worth being convicted over, what hill are we worth dying on. Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself. The King James Version reads that Daniel purposed in his heart. You see, the Babylonians could change his name, they could change the setting, they could change his education, but they could not change his heart. They couldn't change who he was inside. They couldn't change his character because when your heart belongs to God, you can live unstained in Babylon. Now, if Daniel were a lesser man, he may have made up some excuses for eating from the king's menu. He may have said, you know, I am here not by my own volition. It's not my fault. I, I've, I've been carried away to this nation. Nobody will even know. I might as well just eat. I mean, I've got to have my nourishment, right? Folks, we can always find a reason or an excuse not to do what's right. We can always find an excuse when we don't want to do the right thing. But Daniel didn't need an excuse. Compromise and conformity were not even on his radar screen. He was not going to defile himself. Conviction on the inside will always show itself on the outside. Strong conviction precedes great action. It makes you wonder, why do so many Christians compromise with the world around them? You know, we can think about it, and we can come up with several reasons. We compromise because it's easier, mainly. We compromise because we don't want to be rejected. We don't want to cause a fuss. Sometimes we compromise because we feel like that's the nobler thing to do, unfortunately. There's all kinds of reasons why we compromise rather than standing convicted. Daniel should be a perfect character illustration for us as to why we should always be convicted about the things that matter most. Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself. And my friends, I don't think Daniel made up his mind in that moment. I don't think that one moment he decided, okay, I, I'm going to make up my mind. I'm not going to defile myself with the king's choice food. No, I think he made up his mind a long time before that. I think Daniel's heart had been given to God long before that incident. In that moment, his character shined through. But that was not the moment where he defined himself. He defined himself long before that by giving his heart to God and resolving or purposing in his heart that he would not defile himself. You see, that line in the sand was drawn a long time before this incident. That's why he could stand firm in the culture that he was in. Sadly, so many times, faith does not define the Christian. Conviction does not define the Christian. Rather, conformity and compromise do. A steady diet of compromise seems to be the order of the day in our culture. We compromise because it's easier, because we want to avoid conflict, whatever it is. Perhaps one faces the struggle to compromise because the fear of rejection from their family, from those closest to them. Maybe one compromises because they don't feel that they're strong enough to stand for what is right. Whatever it is, we need to do a, a heart test and figure out what our line in the sand is, what hill it is that we're going to die on, and stand firmly convicted. Perhaps no one faces the challenge to compromise more than our teenagers. 
I've been there, and I think that they face as many challenges today as ever. That the challenge to, to compromise their faith, whether it be drinking, whether it be maybe even drugs, whether it be pornography, whatever it may be, whether it, whether it be saying no to, to sexual relations outside of marriage, whatever it may be, our, our teenagers face the call to compromise probably more so than any of us. It's hard to stand firm and convicted in a culture of compromise. And sometimes when you resist the call to compromise, you can face mocking and ridicule, maybe even bullying. It's tough. No one ever said that it would be easy, but certainly it is worth it. Do not lose your faith over something that is not worth it. It is so much easier to die on that hill than to walk away in shameful disgrace. We need to be a Daniel. We need to be resolute and convicted. Rather than being some sort of spiritual chameleon who, who blends in with our surroundings, we need to be someone who stands out, who sticks out because of our conviction. You know, the story is told of a, of a gentleman who was opposed to the Civil War and he decided that he was not going to fight for either side, that he was instead going to wear a blue coat and gray pants. And guess what happened? He got shot from both sides. Sometimes compromise is impossible. Sometimes you've just got to pick a side and you've got to stand, regardless of the consequences. And certainly that is the case when it comes to faith. We have to be Daniels in that we need to stand up no matter what. God wants convicted Christians whose faith is firmly rooted in him and not compromising Christians who blend in with the world around him. In other words, the main lesson that we learned from Daniel this morning is don't be a Babylonian. Don't be someone who compromises your faith just to fit in with the culture around you. You know, from the window of an airplane, you can see the beauty of God's creation. You know, thousands of feet above the air, you can look down and see the majesty of what God has created. And one of the most beautiful things that I have noticed is a winding, crooked river. And you know why a river is crooked, right? Because it conforms to whatever hinders it. It just conforms around it, right? It takes the path of least resistance. It takes the easy way. And we can be like a river in that we can be crooked too. We can be crooked in our character when we take the path of least resistance, when we simply conform to the things around us. Yeah, I read one time that there are two farms in Canada with two parallel fences only about two feet apart, and they run about half a mile. Why? Well, the reason is because two farmers had a disagreement that turned into an all-out feud. One farmer decided to build a fence between the land and split the cost, which sounded like a reasonable thing to do, but the other farmer wanted no part of that. He didn't want to contribute, so his neighbor built the fence anyway. And once it was completed, the stubborn farmer said, I see we have a fence. And the gentleman said, what do you mean, we? You know, I built this fence, and he said, uh, the property line I, I had surveyed, and I built the fence two feet into my land, which means that some of my land is outside the fence, and if any of your cows set foot on my land, I'm going to shoot them. The farmer understood this man to be serious, and so he had to build another fence so that he could have access to the land. And so you have these two fences running parallel for about a mile or so that are only two feet apart. And though these two farmers are dead now, those two fences still stand as a testament to the, to the stubbornness and the disrespect that these two men had for one another. And the reason I bring that up is because being convicted sometimes is, is associated with being mean-spirited. We feel like that if we're convicted, if we're, if we're going to die on this hill, if we're going to draw this line in the sand, then we've got to be disrespectful, we've got to be rude, we've got to be arrogant. That just comes along with the territory, right? They, they go hand in hand, but not true. Yeah, I've told you before, I get, I get kind of discouraged when I see Christians who are lashing out at our country, at our, our, our leaders, and the decisions that are, that are being made. Do I agree with them? Absolutely not. Do they make me angry, some of the things that are going on? Absolutely. But sometimes the things that we post on Facebook and even the things that we say are very unchristlike. Can we stand in opposition? Can we stand convicted without being unchristian? Yes. In fact, we should, right? 
as I said before, there, it, 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 there is never a reason to be unchristian. There's never an excuse to be unchristian. It is never Christian to be unchristian. You notice how Daniel handled the situation. Being right and practicing righteousness doesn't permit us to be disrespectful to others. I think sometimes we believe it does. I think sometimes we believe that conviction and disrespect just go hand in hand. But to stand where God stands doesn't give us the right to be unchristian. We can be dead wrong in the way that we handle being right. Conviction doesn't mean that we compromise our Christianity. Again, notice how Daniel handled the situation. After resolving to not defile himself with the king's choice food, he didn't go on a hunger strike. He didn't go on some radical protest. Instead, he sought out the commander of the officials, and he respectfully shared with him his concern, his dilemma. Now, the commander feared for his own life because what if... They don't follow through with the king's edict and eat the king's choice food, and they become haggard looking, they become uh, uh, malnourished. The commander's going to have his head removed, right? But Daniel kindly asked him to let him carry out this miracle 10 day diet, right? Daniel had full faith in God. Daniel said, Please. Test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. Daniel was completely convinced that God would see him and his friends through this entire ordeal. And that, of course, is precisely what happened. But you notice how Daniel approached the situation. Romans 12 and 18, Paul wrote, If possible... If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace. With who? With all men. What if the commander had said no to Daniel's request? Would he have cowardly said, okay, I'll eat the king's choice food. It was worth a shot. I don't think so. I think Daniel, had, because he had purposed in his heart, because he had made up his mind, he was going to do what he was convicted to do. But his first reaction was to not shoot out of both barrels. His first reaction was to handle it with respect and integrity. You see, folks, we shouldn't build fences where we can build bridges. We should never build fences when we can build bridges. Our, our concern, in our concern for compromise, we should always remember to be respectful. Yes, we should be concerned about compromising our Christianity. Yes, there are hills that we need to be willing to die on. Yes, we need to be convicted. But we should seek to always do so with respect. If our actions are no different than the troublemakers, then we have effectively blended in with the world around us. When the world asks us to compromise, when it seeks to mold us and to shape us, we need to seek to stand tall, to stand firm as the song that we sang right before the lesson, deeply rooted in our faith. And maybe, just maybe, by doing so, by showing respect to our fellow man, to the person who is maybe not in agreement with us, maybe, just maybe, we change them. Maybe we, we touch their heart to the point that they want what we have. I do know this, though. When we slam a door on someone, it's very hard to ever pry it back open. We need to be aware of that. We need to be aware that, that while we stand convicted, we can also stand Christ-like. Paul said, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Sadly, all too often, our first reaction is anger and disrespect. There's no long fuse. We explode, and we become rude or short-tempered and unloving. We have to work at that and make sure that our conviction comes from a love for Christ and a love for God and His Word. In conclusion, here's some things that I think are very important for us to remember. Daniel's situation is not any different than ours today. The world is constantly trying to reprogram us. That's what Daniel faced in Babylon. They were trying to brainwash these young men Scholars estimate that Daniel and his, his friends were in their early teens, probably. The king was trying to brainwash them, trying to reprogram, and our, 
Our culture is trying to do the same thing. Our culture is constantly trying to reprogram us and teach us that certain Christian values should not be held in high esteem, that they shouldn't be sought, whether it be traditional marriage, whatever it may be. Our culture is seeking to deprogram and to reprogram so that we think differently than what God would have us to think. And we also must make up our minds well in advance. The world is constantly trying to reprogram us, therefore we must make up our minds well in advance. Daniel didn't wait until that moment to resolve to draw a line in the sand or to purpose in his heart that he would not defile himself. He made, up that, 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 he made that decision long before, and we, do as, we have to as well. We have to make that decision now that we will not defile ourselves, that we will draw a line in the sand and say we are not going past this point no matter what. No matter what, we will not defile ourselves. And finally, we need to remember that this is no small thing. Yeah, I think sometimes in our, in our dilemma of conviction or compromise, we go ahead and compromise because we don't think it's that big of a deal. We kind of say to ourselves, is, it, is this really that big of a deal? I mean, in Daniel's situation, somebody may have thought, you know, Daniel, it's just food. I mean, what's the big deal? But to Daniel, it was a big deal. It was a huge deal because it would mean defiling himself before God. And there are many sins in our culture that Bradley talked about last quarter in his auditorium class that have become respectable sins. They're just not that big a deal anymore. One of them I think about is gossip. You know, we just don't think of things like gossip or lying as being that big a deal anymore. We have to purpose in our hearts right now that we're not going to defile ourselves. This is no small matter. Standing firmly convicted for God in faith is never a small matter. That is always a hill worth dying on. Unfaithfulness is never a small thing. Colossians 3 and 17, Paul wrote, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. If he is Lord of your life, then every fiber, every square inch of your being must be given to him. It must be yielded to him. You must surrender to him in all ways. Whether it seems like a small thing or not, faith is always a big thing. Some of you know that a couple years ago, I blame Larry Bell. One of our elders got me into exercising. I, I, I realized I'm not getting any younger. I need, to, uh, I need to do something. Now, what he prescribed for me was P90X, and if you don't know what that is, it's a pretty rigorous workout routine that I've done for a couple years now, and I don't say that to brag because I can't get through it still. I have a tough time. Uh, I'm not a very uh, uh, physically fit person. I tried to be, and I tried to get through it, but I, every time I do the exercise or the workout, I realize just how out of shape I, I am. You'd think it'd be getting better, but I don't know that it is. But anyway, one of the one of the focus areas in this workout, and really one of the focal points of all exercise right now, seems to be the core. You heard that term? You know, people are working their core. Professional athletes are working on their core, whether it's a professional golfer, whether it's a tennis player, football player, whatever. They're working on their core. And the core is the muscles that basically go from here to here, the glutes, the abs, those things. Because they say if your core is strong, then it works everything else. That there is not a single sport or really activity that you do that doesn't require a strong core. And so that is the new push today. You gotta have a strong core. And many of the workouts that are involved, whether it be P90X or some other workout regimen, they talk about engaging the core. Engage your core when you work out so that you can make it stronger. I was thinking about that the other day and I was thinking about how much that applies to our Christianity. We need to engage our core. What is our core? Well, we're going to have a series on it in a few, few months. Our core is, is loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That, that's the core. Loving our neighbor as ourselves. That's the core of Christianity. Loving God with every fiber of our being. We need to engage our core. We need to make certain that our core is fit that it is healthy, that it is strong. And part of the way that we do that is through being convicted and having a faith that is firmly rooted in Christ Jesus. If you don't have that type of faith this morning, I encourage you 
to move toward that. If you are not a child of God and that you have not put on Christ in baptism for the remission of sins, do that this morning. And if you are a Christian and perhaps you have allowed yourself to become weak in your core, let us help you get back on track. Whatever your need is, come now as we stand and as we sing.